rocks. And that's what you'll find pretty much anywhere on Earth. It's pretty much what you'll find on Mars if you were to go and collect magnesium on Mars. And if you go out to the Oort cloud, it would be pretty much about the same ratios. So the ratios of one of these samples that we got from an unusual observation of, a, of an object are... In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find Science Robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about their research. Thanks Science Robotics for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. What gives you interest in testing material from your fake crashes? Can you tell us more of the story and then trust to hear to do that? Right. So um, I, I got interested actually a long time ago, uh, about a decade, when there was a report that uh, basically on the internet and YouTubes about a small uh, mummy that people thought was an alien, right? Because the mummy looked very unusual. It was only very small. And I thought, well, gee, I could do the genetics of this and determine whether or not it is something else or whether it's human, or actually at the time I thought it was, uh, the mummy of a, of some kind of a monkey. Uh, we eventually published a paper showing that in fact, it was a, uh, just a human with, uh, it was an unfortunate, probably a, a preterm birth uh, that somebody had mistakenly identified as uh, an alien. And uh, we published a paper on it, showed that the genetics uh, of it was such that it likely had a number of mutations that caused bone deformities, which is what caused it to look the way that it did. Uh, the UFO community didn't like that. Uh, primarily because I was uh, pulling the rug out from underneath uh, the claims of uh, a number of individuals. But to me, it wasn't about proving or disproving one way or the other. It was just getting the data out there and getting good science done. And uh, that eventually then brought me to the attention uh, of people in the government who wanted then for me to help them study uh, individuals who they had claimed uh, had gotten close to a supposed craft. This is all alleged. I wasn't there. I'm only the person doing the testing. And they asked me to do and help them with uh, analysis of some of these individuals. Uh, if you look at who these individuals were, they were all either intelligence personnel or they were um, uh, Department of Defense uh, people in aircraft pilots, etc. And some of these individuals were actually related to what you might know of as the, uh, the Nimitz aircraft event where the pilots had seen uh, anomalous aircraft capable of doing things that supposedly we currently cannot do. Uh, and um, that was kind of my introduction to it. Then they started saying, okay, well, gee, you can do these other studies on uh, on the people in their blood uh, and the MRIs that we've done, but we also have these materials that supposedly some of these craft had left behind. What would you do with them if we gave you some of them or we asked you to help with some of them? And then, uh, so the first thing I said was, well, we're just gonna go and we're gonna do straightforward materials research science with these. They're metals, they're straightforward ways to study these things. Uh, so I had some of these instruments in my lab. These are various kinds of mass spectrometers that could determine both the elemental as well as the isotopic uh, constituencies of these things. So we did that. We published a paper. My push has always been that you don't do science through press release. You do science through peer review. You wait until the peer review is done 
uh, and then you publish the paper. And when the paper's published, then you start talking about it because that's how the right way that you should be doing science is. I want to ask you first before going to the material part, were you afraid to do that at the first class? That's a terrified afraid. For example, when we have Avilob, he has like a pain, painful experiences sometimes, people, you know, skeptics, and you know already that there's a lot of shame sometimes to talk about these topics. For you, the, the decision to do that, were you afraid or skeptical? Or? I wasn't I wasn't afraid per se. I was, af well, I was afraid of what some of my colleagues might think of me for doing it. But the way I argued back with them when they brought it up, I mean, one of them directly told me, Gary, you're going to ruin your career talking about this, was I, I said, I, I'm not coming to any conclusions. I'm just trying to convince you that the data is real. You can't argue that the data as collected is real. You can only argue about the interpretation of the data. Right. If you make the wrong interpretation, you can be made to look like a fool. But if you basically only say, here are a number of hypotheses that might explain the data, but I haven't proven them yet, but I will convince you that the data has been collected correctly, you help me interpret it. You can't argue with me about that. I mean, what scientist takes a possible explanation off the table, right, if the if nothing has been proven or disproven yet. What scientist throws away data, which is absolutely real? Again, it's, it's, that's the, it, it's a subtle distinction. And a lot of the people in the public think that data collection equals conclusion. It does not. It's all about the collection of the data and then getting people to help you interpret it. Because it's a mystery, right? I mean, for instance, some of the materials that we've measured uh, have anomalous isotope ratios. Okay, so the isotopes for in, in, in one of these examples, and the, the data has to be reproduced by others, uh, has uh, incorrect magnesium isotope ratios. So magnesium has three isotopes, uh, 24, 25, and 26. 24 is about 80%. And then it's like 11 and 9% or 9 and 11 for 25 and 26. And that's what you'll find pretty much anywhere on Earth. It's pretty much what you'll find on Mars if you were to go and collect magnesium on Mars. And if you go out to the Oort cloud, it would be pretty much about the same ratios. So the ratios of one of these samples that we got from an unusual observation of, a, of an object uh, is something like 60%, 20%, and 10% right, or 16%, adding up to 100, completely off normal. So that's not proof of anything, right? That's just data. So you have to ask the question, okay, well, who would change the ratios, right? Because if, if you make the assumption, and it's an assumption, that there's nothing in the, our immediate solar system that should have such anomalous ratios, Okay, so that means it was probably made somehow by somebody. Why would you do that? So the only thing that humans use isotopes for these days is either to blow things up as tracers in the body uh, for, or to use it to kill cancer. And sometimes isotope ratios are used now in money to uh, embed isotopes stable isotopes in money as a signature for anti-counterfeiting, right? So that's the only things that humans do it for. We don't quite understand why you would change the isotope ratios for magnesium. There's no industrial purpose. So it, it's not just, the question is not so much, did it happen? The question that's more important is why would you do it, right? Why would you change it? Or maybe it's that somebody didn't purposefully change it, but perhaps, and this is perhaps a good thing for your audience to think about, and I'm more than happy to receive emails on this, is what industrial process would create this such that it would, would be, these isotope ratios would be downstream of some upstream process. Now, the people in the government with whom I've been talking about, again, speculation, is, well, maybe this is downstream of a propulsion process that something is using and that these ratios are changed from normal magnesium ratios to these altered ratios. 
I don't know. I just find it fascinating. I mean, who couldn't be interested in something like this? If it's done, I do it in my spare time, to be quite honest. It's not the primary function of my lab. But maybe going to the sample itself, the material, because I think maybe we'll, even though just asking about the, the origin of the samples or the collected samples, and I want to make sure they are really from unidentified flying objects or whatever. For you, you don't care about who's doing that, but you want the data. But how to make sure the samples are really related to something, maybe, as you say, exotic? So, you know, I, I get lots of emails, and the people with whom I work, of course, get lots of. Uh, uh, offerings from people of, of, of stuff that supposedly came from an object. So much of the work that we do uh, is things that we have a, a, good, a good sense of the, uh, the propriety of it, right? That the, the object had multiple witnesses. Uh, people got to the material as soon as possible. Uh, and that there was a chain of custody. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you can only trust the people involved. And, you know, you usually look to see, or, well, are these people asking for money for this? And if they're asking for money, that is a big red flag. And we usually put those kinds of samples at the end of the list, right? If they, if they personally have no monetary gain uh, to make from it, and if anything, they don't even want their names released, that's usually a positive, right? Because they're just saying, hey, this, this fell in my backyard, uh, and, uh, or I saw this happen in the case of the magnesium. It happened actually uh, in Brazil, uh, Ubatuba, Brazil. Uh, it was a fisherman. Um, he saw this glowing object, and then it released something that basically exploded. And he picked up some of this material and he went to some scientists that he knew and said, what is this? This is what I saw. And, and that's all you know. In the case of the paper that we published, we actually published a paper, a peer-reviewed paper in uh, progress in aeronautics, uh, aeronautical sciences. And uh, it was peer-reviewed, took two years to go through the peer review. And it was another one that actually happened, happened in an area called Council Bluffs, uh, Iowa. And uh, there were probably about six or seven uh, simultaneous witnesses, saw an object, saw it release something, and they actually thought it was uh, an airplane crash. And so everybody rushed to the place where they saw it drop, which was in the middle of a park. Uh, and they found a pool of molten metal. Uh, and they collected it. The police came. They took pictures of it. I have the original Polaroids from this. This was a circa mid-1970s. Uh, and so we did the analysis of it. There's nothing actually in that one unusual about it, except that we looked at multiple samples, subsamples from the original sample, and each one was different in terms of the elements that were in it, right? So there were things like titanium and iron and uh, chromium and a few other things. Uh, and it it wasn't that the isotopes were different, it's just that the ratios of the elements were different, which means that whatever it was was incompletely mixed, right? It was not homogeneous. It wasn't like somebody put a smoothie in a blender, you know, and mixed it all up. It was only partially mixed and then dropped. And so that's another kind of mystery. What, who would, let's say it were conventional, who would drop 30 pounds of molten incompletely melted material in the middle of nowhere from a hovering object. Uh, I don't know, but it's interesting. Uh, I've been contacted by a person here in California who had a similar thing happen on his property that his mother had observed, and I was just speaking with him yesterday, uh, where there's an object and it just releases molten metal, and he's sending me some of the molten metals. So there's actually probably, I know of about half a dozen stories like that. And so, you know, it's, let's call it a hobby. I'm collecting the information. I'm uh, creating a catalog of what it is that we're observing. I'll at some point put uh, the ones that are more interesting, I'll get them published. And, you know, at a certain point, no one's going to want to publish this stuff anymore because it starts to become repetitive. We'll just create a database and perhaps publish a review paper that says, here's all the things that we found. 
you tell me what it is. Now, that's just my personal interest, but now you have the US government and the Department of Defense has passed a bill that you, some of your uh, listeners might be aware of. The Department of Defense bill now officially has created an office which is to collect this kind of information from all across the US services, uh, observations, materials. There's now money that's coming to the table. I'll be applying for some of this money to help me pay for some of the analyses that we're doing because the analysis actually is expensive. It's, I mean, I've done all of it so far out of my own pocket and it's probably cost me about $70,000 to do this analysis. So it's not a small amount. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, filthy rich or anything, but I felt it was fun and something to do. Uh, but having done it and published it and being willing to talk about it has in a positive way brought me to the attention of people in the government who do think that this is important. And they've said, well, look, you're willing to do it. You're not afraid. And you seem to be able to talk about it respectfully. Why don't you come and help us? And since the paper has gone published, has been published and other uh, things have happened, uh, I now have students at Stanford and at Harvard and other places uh, in between who said, hey, we find this interesting. We're willing to help. So the objective has been met. And Avi is doing the same thing. Avi Loeb is doing the same thing. The objective has been met. Talk about it in a credible way, in a respectful way. Don't demean the people who claim that it's extraterrestrials and don't demean the people who claim otherwise. Just say, let's collect the data. But it brings in people who are open-minded enough who can perhaps contribute. Because let's say it is something not from this earth. What can we learn from these materials? I mean, maybe it's just, as I've said in a couple of other interviews, maybe this is just a form of exhaust, a leftover from a process of propulsion or energy generation that these things might use. What can we learn from that? What does it tell us about the engine by studying these things? I find that fascinating because if they can move the way that they're moving, uh, it's doing things that we don't know how to do, which means that there's, a, there's a, 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 an understanding of physics that they have that we don't. Wouldn't that be fascinating to understand? But uh, maybe I'm curious about what kind of tests you did in these materials. You mentioned there's something maybe exotic or maybe never made before, but what other maybe characteristic so the test you have noticed? And you think that was very maybe peculiar because you mentioned, I don't know, there are many possibilities here, but maybe from the tests you did, what kind of interesting or something peculiar from the tests you did besides what you well, noticed? Well, so the isotope ratios are probably the most interesting one, right? Because it, at the time that this, um, the magnesium sample was found, it would have cost a lot of money for somebody to change the isotope ratios by conventional means. You can do it either by a form of centrifugation, you can do it by a form of uh, gas phase separation. Um, you know, the, for instance, the, you know, the, the centrifuges that people use to make uranium, uranium uh, isotopes. Right. I mean, those are expensive to run. Uh, you can go online, people who are interested, there's companies that sell some of these isotopes and they sell them in milligram quantities and they cost tens of thousands of dollars to get the purified isotopes. So, uh, you know, some of the stuff we have, we have it in the pounds. So if you look at the cost it would take, it's in the many millions of dollars. It's not something you blow up on a beach in uh, Brazil and just let it spew all over the beach side in the water, right? So that I find interesting. Um, there's another material that somebody, uh, and I have a, some pieces of it. Um, there's another material that's interesting. It's a, it's a bismuth magnesium uh, layered, uh, clearly it's industrial and it's layered in a way that is at the um, a few nanometers per layer. Um, some people claim that it might be um, a waveguide, a metamaterial waveguide. That's not something when this was found, 
that we had the ability to make. So the open question is, is it, is it, was it manufactured or as some people have claimed, maybe it's just a byproduct of standard smelting and somebody found it from the bottom of a, of a smelting pot, right? So I don't know, but I've looked at the material. Uh, it is layered uh, in an interesting way. Um, and each of the layers is individually uh, made of a, of a different element. That doesn't sound like something you find in a smelting pot, right? Um, no matter how you how how well you 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 tune your smelting. So again, it's it's I don't know what these things are, but now that the office is uh, funded, basically, I'm hoping to gain to gain access to some of the other materials that are claimed to be owned within the government. Uh, to take a look at it. Now, interestingly, it's not just the US government that has these things, right? There's actually, uh, there's actually some stories coming out of China that the Chinese, uh, um, some of the Chinese aircraft carriers are seeing the same thing. There's stories coming out of Russia. There's a very good story out of two stories out of both India and Iran about things that have been seen. Uh, so again, seen by the air forces of those respective countries. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not America centric. I know France, for instance, has a very big program on the study of these things. Uh, in, it's, and it's, it's a government funded program. So, uh, it, you know, although there, everybody thinks that it's all about America, it's not. This is worldwide. Um, these things are seen, again, what they are, I don't know, but as Avi Loeb has said, let's collect the data, All right? It's what I've been saying for the last, you know, many years. Uh, and then, you know, if, if we can bring the right kinds of minds to the study of this, you know, either we'll prove that it's just something natural and it's not something from out there, or if it is, I mean, the, it's, a, it's a bit of a Las Vegas bet but if it is something from out there, why wouldn't we want to know this, right? And to know perhaps in a different way, we are not alone. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point, but maybe I'm curious to ask you because one of the questions from the audience about this puzzle and the material is, is not the full picture, the whole materials or the whole samples. I don't know what kind of percentage that you have this kind of access to these samples and to make this full story. Because now you just have the testers and this is something peculiar, but you mentioned you still also need to access more samples or other. Yeah. So. Yeah, there are more, I mean, all we're getting right now, and this is of course, I mean, I think the questioner, the person asking the question is right, is we're getting only a small piece of the picture. Uh, and, you know, if I'm getting only a small piece of an object, I wonder, what it is that I've been given, right? And if I'm being fed something on purpose, which is wrong, a hoax, you know, a person in the intelligence agency once told me, he said, you know, Gary, when a scientist gets 95% of the answer, they think they can publish. In the intelligence services, when we get 95% of the answer, we feel that somebody has given it to us. We are interested in the 5% we don't know that's a different mindset. And I think that's the mindset of the, of the person asking the question, which is the right, an, right way to ask it, is what don't we know, even though we think we have something interesting. So, but that's, I mean, th that is my question. I want to know more about it. I, I think I've got a piece of the, of the puzzle, but you know, there's, there are other objects supposedly that have more story behind them. I would like to get a hold of something which is not historical. I would like to get something which is contemporaneous, something which has happened recently, something where the, the story is new, the object we can get access to almost immediately so that there's no question, bring all of the forensic resources of materials analysis to the story to understand it. 
right? But it, but it's interestingly not just about the objects the, that we get, the observations of what some of these things can do. So for instance, the USS Nimitz objects, that the so-called Tic Tacs that went from sea level to space in less than a second. So a physicist calculated the amount of energy it would require for let's say a one ton object, let's estimate that the thing was about one ton. Um, let's say that the object was about one ton. Um, the energy required to make that movement is like more than the nuclear energy output of the United States for a whole year. And yet these things were making those kinds of movements every few seconds. So either it's a projection, a holographic projection of something and it's not really an object it's pretty darn good looking uh, projection. Uh, or it's an object that has access to energy or a means of propulsion that we don't understand that doesn't need that kind of energy, but it, it knows how to do it without conventional physics explanations. So, and yet this is, these are objects that were seen not just by the pilots, they were seen by multiple radar systems for multiple different ships at the same time. So that's another kind of evidence that then you have to ask, okay, well, if they can do it, how are they doing it? So, you know, in, in a way, these are like, it's almost like an intelligence test. You can look at it and say, oh, I can dismiss it. Eh, I don't understand it. It can't possibly be. So therefore, I'm just not going to think about it at all. That would be a stupid thing to do, in my opinion. Or you can look at it and say, huh, this is a clue this is a kind of physics that maybe we can do. I mean, when humans watched birds fly from thousands of years ago, they said, we want to fly too. How can we do it? And eventually we figured out how to. So if we can see these objects, whether they're natural phenomenon, whether they're some other civilization or what have you, it's almost like the, the term, you know, laying of breadcrumbs. Somebody is showing us something. Something is showing us a possibility that maybe we can think about how to access. You know, and when, when, you, when you think about this, I mean, there's a physicist by the name of Alcubier. Some of your readers might and listeners might know of Alcubier. You know, he's, uh, he's a Mexican physicist who came up with a way to uh, manipulate Einstein's equations to create a so-called warp bubble. Right, and this warp bubble could allow us to potentially fly faster than light or travel faster than light. I mean, there's a there's a serious limitation. The amount of energy that's required to accomplish what he thinks he wants to do is well beyond human means to uh, to uh, undertake. But that serious possibility has led to an inf an entire field of physics serious physicists, not crackpots, to say, well, actually, Dr. Alcubierre, you don't need as much energy as your first equations required. We can change these terms and actually we can get about a, we can use a thousand fold less energy to accomplish the same thing. So, you know, whether anybody eventually creates a faster than light drive is less important as the physics and the thinking process that it uh, creates in the individuals uh, and physicists to come up with ways to accomplish it in the long run. It's a, you know, it's like a, it's like a word game. It's a, it's a test of your um, creativity. And I think that that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you the correlation in the, the material you're testing and the tech tech um, that would have been sold in 2015. Do you think the material you testing and what we saw in the video was pretty, uh, sometimes it sounds scary. What, what the thing that can do this behavior as you mentioned and illustrated, do you see any correlation between the material and the Tic Tac, for example, that we saw in 2015? Do you think something here you can connect the dots between the material and how something that can do something we can understand, at least we have, we have never encountered something like that. Do you think any correlation between the material and this structure of this object? Okay, so I, 
am a big reader of science fiction, right? So a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking uh, and coming up with uh, fun ideas about how the universe might be structured and who might be in it. If I were to speculate from a science fiction standpoint, I might say that the um, materials that we see ejected are a form of exhaust from an engine that has said, I don't need this anymore. Uh, I've, I've used it. I've used it for what it's good for. I'm going to get rid of it. It's kind of a, maybe you think of it as a fuel. The fuel is, starts as one form and then it gets manipulated by some process we don't understand. And when they're done with it, it gets ejected. Just like we do with a car, right? We have fuel, gasoline, it gets ejected in the form of hydrocarbons uh, and uh, water if you have a good catalytic converter. So we don't care about spewing this into our atmosphere. Maybe these things don't care about offloading a little bit of metal every once in a while, as long as they're not dropping it on somebody's head, <laughs> right? So um, that's a correlation that I see. Um, the other material that I'm aware of uh, is that structured one. There's physicists who are, uh, you know, uh, they're serious physicists, but I think mainstream physicists would consider them fringe that say these are waveguides, right? That this is a way that you can uh, structure uh, electrical, electromagnetic impulses. And this is a great thing for your audience to think about. Uh, these metamaterials are somehow structuring things that allow you to alter gravity. I don't know, right? I mean, there's metamaterials that you're developed up at Berkeley nearby that can make things appear invisible to certain wavelengths. I mean, this is reality. It's published in Nature and Science. It's, you know, there's ways you can alter at least wavelengths to make things appear to certain frequencies uh, invisible. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're at the only very beginning of our understanding of what physics really is, uh, that there's really a lot more to be understood about how you can compose materials to accomplish novel uh, functions. And again, your audience is very well aware of the kinds of things that you can do at the nanomaterials level. You put a, an atom of this here, an atom of that there, an atom of that there, and now you have a qubit, right, for quantum processing. You put different kinds of atoms together in different ways, and you can get exotic particles in materials. You know, you can get plasmons and all kinds of other things that can be used in ways that 20, 30 years ago would have been thought impossible. So, you know, I think that what I look at, say, for instance, these isotopes, and I say, well, perhaps we haven't fully understood what the various isotopes of a given element can do that are different one from another. I mean, here's an interesting one. So um, lithium, right, has two isotopes. And lithium is used, uh, standard lithium is used as a, uh, in basically psychiatry and psychology for people who have certain kinds of um, mental disorders and lithium is used to stabilize these people. I happen to know this because one of my aunts was on lithium. She had a, uh, a um, disorder. So I think the lithium ratios, I forget some, uh, let's say they're 60, 40. So they did a study with rats and they used the two different ratios. They purified them and they gave them lithium, you know, uh, one of the isotopes and lithium, the other isotope. And this was done to nursing mothers of rats. Why they, I don't remember the exact study and why they did it, but what they found was that nursing rats would, if they were given one of the isotopes, would overfeed the pups and over, you know, pay attention to them. And the other isotope, they would completely uh, ignore the pups. That's interesting. So biologically, something in the brain bound those two isotopes differently. So they're not the same, even though most chemists think of isotopes as being the same. We, we talk about them in the same, but 
the natural ratio was just right, kind of like the Goldilocks, right in the middle, but the two extremes would give you very different and actually pathologic results. So, you know, there's, there's good reason to think that chemistry could take, or physics could take advantage of novel kinds of isotopes in very useful ways. Another example of this is uh, silicon. Um, there are certain ways that you can make silicon-based qubits that some of the isotopes, one of the isotopes of silicon, is much, much better and will hold a, its, its uh, quantum distinctiveness longer uh, with one of the isotopes of silicon versus another. And that's published, right? That's not just something somebody talked about. So there's, uh, what I hope this does, these kinds of results do, is make people think a little more broadly about that, you know, most material science looks at the 85 stable elements, but maybe somebody else looks at the table of elements and says, there's 253 flavors here that could be more subtly used. Maybe they build their materials world with 250 or so stable isotopes, whereas we're still back in the, you know, the Bronze Age and only working with 85 elements. So. Yeah. For that part, do you think, I'm just curious in the material science, do you think, because I know some series that like maybe advanced technology from other location or, of course there's many possibilities, but do you think that you are fully aware what could be maybe, if we speak about security or intelligence, some advanced material from other places like, for example, you mentioned China, Russia, for example, here. You are not aware of, maybe. No, I'm, I'm not aware of them, but, you know, I do. Uh, so Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon, uh, who are the people who have been, who brought those videos forward uh, and who know most of what, what's going on, and another guy by the name of Eric Davis, are actually now good friends of mine, I, or I should say colleagues that I, I work with. And they and the others who are knowledgeable about what the current capabilities, at least of the United States are, is they say, we can't do this. And if China and Russia can do it, well, the whole world is in trouble, right? Because, you know, if, if they can move at this kind of way that, that would basically negate the capabilities of any of the armed forces in the world, you know, but then you also find out that they're studying this stuff too because they're seeing it. And I don't think that they've come to any conclusions either about it. But in a way, and this is what, if anything, scares me, it's you, you're, I think, perhaps seeing the beginning of a new arms race, right? And this is an arms race to understand that the first who does understand this will have an advantage. I don't like that idea personally. I'm not... I'm not that, you know, I, 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 I want whoever the good guys are, and I'm not saying who the good guys are, to get the first, to get it first, right? But, which is the other reason why I feel that having open access to this kind of information as much as we can, will make sure that nobody has the upper hand. If we can get it open access, it will give the capability, maybe someone in, Nigeria figures it out first, and they industrialize it first. Wouldn't that be great for Africa, right, to do this? Wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, one country in the world has the, uh, has the monopoly on figuring it out. So I feel, though, that the only way to get others around the world to perhaps you know, not the, not the three or four main uh, military uh, countries, is to get as much of this information out uh, in a safe way, um, in a credible way. And the beginning of getting that information out is to make it, uh, is to make it respectable to ask the questions, right? And then to give people uh, data, hopefully, that they can figure it out. I mean, 
proving that the data is real is the first thing to then get credible people to begin to ask the right questions about it and propose hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So yes, we already speculate where it comes from, but if you can push more again, why it is designed in that way? If you can tell maybe the advantages or maybe limitation for the design, we don't know where it comes from. There is many possibilities, but why this design in particular? And do you think we can reverse engineer this design? This one? Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, that is the intent of what I'm interested in. If we can, it, so let's say, again, pure speculation, let's say that this so-called metamaterial is uh, uh, the one that with the layered bismuth magnesium um, stuff, uh, let's say that it is somehow involved with a propulsion. Okay, well, if it's, if it's part of the, of the skin of the craft, or it's some layer of the craft that involves with the propulsion, okay, and we, we know that it has the characteristics of a metamaterial, in other words, it's these thinly layered objects that you could pass a terahertz wave through uh, that would cause some um, change in the gravitational constant, or perhaps it it is it creates a um, I don't know some sort of uh, electromagnetic field that is repulsive. Okay, well maybe we can make that. You know, we don't have to rely on the small piece of it. How would we make that? And if we made that. And then we put, you know, we, we tested it with various kinds of uh, terahertz waves or what have you. Uh, what would it do? So, I mean, that's the beginning of reverse engineering. The other part of reverse engineering is just looking at the, looking at the equations of what these things could, you know, using our current understanding of physics, changing some of the assumptions of, uh, of um, Einstein's equations, which is what these physicists have done and say, okay, well, if we make these assumptions rather than those assumptions, uh, okay, we can do this, how would we do it? And again, this is what the people who are doing and creating some of these or trying to create some of these warp drives are, are doing right now. They're saying, okay, how can we make it practical? And the reason why I, I talk, talk about it in this way is that in, in my laboratory work, um, you know, we ask a question and we say, first, what is inevitable, right? What is the kind of data that inevitably I require to answer this question? Because the current approach to collecting data is insufficient. So we say, this is the kind of data I want. Then we imagine a, let's say a science fiction level instrument a perfect instrument that could do it. We say, okay, well, we can't make that perfect instrument. And then we, we backtrack a few steps until we think about something practical that can accomplish this. And, you know, we've created multiple instruments and sold companies that have started out of my lab in the many hundreds of millions of dollars, right? I mean, and, and, and then it becomes useful because we, we start with the impossible and then we think backwards and we reverse engineer until we make it practical. And this is, I think, what we're gonna be able to do with some of these objects and capabilities is that we'll look in, at it and say, well, we don't know how to do it today, but here's what maybe we could do that could accomplish something close. Uh, you know, and, and militaries do this all the time. Right, they look at, so when the stealth bomber was made in the United States, Russia didn't have one. So they looked at what we could do and they said, okay, well, you know, we're smart. We can figure this out. We can make it and they've made them, right? So it's, you know, you, you always look at what's possible. And once you know something's possible, it's actually almost inevitable that you will create it. I mean, that's just the way humans are. I mean, that's just the, that's just the power of desire and the power of creativity that drives humans to the next step. It's kind of a, you know, uh, being uh, aware of what your neighbor can do and you want to do it too. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I want to ask you, to which level do you think this material is designed in intelligent way? Since you mentioned that the way we think about the material maybe is completely different what would you try to see or seeking the truth what is actually this 
where it come from? To what level of the intelligence is designed when you think about it from human perspective? I don't know if you get my question, but since there's many speculation here, if you see this, why it's done like this way, do you think this kind of in understanding something we don't understand or intelligence, to which level do you think there's intelligence to come up with something like that? Well, I mean, it's clearly something that has an understanding of physics that we don't, right? So this layered material. So, I mean, he, he, here's an example. A friend of mine who has worked in the CIA and actually ran a number of programs in the CIA, uh, he was in what was called technology acquisition. Uh, that was his thing. It's a, that's a, a nice way of saying he stole stuff from the Russians and the Chinese. He designed the programs that would steal things. He said that they would sometimes acquire technology from Russia that they actually didn't understand because the Russian physicists who had developed it started with different assumptions about things. Eventually, they were able to understand them, but it was, and it wasn't because the Russians got them from some other place. It's just because they had started creatively with a different set of assumptions about what something could do. And so, you know, when you're talking about, let's say, an intelligence that is, let's again speculate, uh, a, a, an intelligence that might be millions of years ahead of us, it, it has knowledge of how to manipulate the material world in ways that we don't. So the best we can hope is to emulate. And the best we can hope is to take it apart. Now, how would you do that? One of the, the instruments that we're building or trying to build in my lab um, is an atomic imaging scope, right? Something which actually sees the position of every atom. As it turns out, there's actually no instrument available today that does that. Uh, there are things called cryo electron microscopy, uh, which can maybe get close. Electron microscopy doesn't do it. There's, uh, there's crystallography, but crystallography requires things to be crystals. And so amorphous materials that have atoms more or less randomly placed, let's say, uh, are not readable by this. So my position has been that if you want to understand some of these materials, you need the atomic position. You need, a, you need a, a, an atomic atlas of what these things are, right? Now, at the same time as I'm developing that, let's say to do this, my primary interest in developing that, in, that thing is for my biology research. Because it's one of those things that I said before is inevitable. Inevitably, we need to know the position of every atom in a cell if we really want to understand it, because form equals function, right? If you can understand the form of something, you can perhaps intuit the function. So, you know, this, uh, this instrument that we want to make has dual function. It can be used for this kind of materials analysis, any kind of forensic or actually research that might be going on in Silicon Valley. Uh, it could be used for metals analysis, or it could be used for the biology research that I want to do. So, so that I think is again an, an example of you see something, you want to understand it, then you say, okay, well, what's the kind of data that I really need to understand what it is? You know, I really, I, I, I don't need to know necessarily what the elements or even the isotopes are. That's almost irrelevant. Knowing the position of those atoms in the material is what is important right? Because that equals the function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you what maybe other question still bondering in mind about this material, or maybe missing pieces in this picture between yourself, but just like think about this material. What other questions do you think you want to answer? Or maybe missing pieces in this problem? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I mean, the missing, well, there's several missing pieces. The, the, the first is, um, frankly, who made it? Right. I mean, that's almost the most important thing because who made it in a way leads you to ask the question, what's their agenda? What is the agenda? What's the goal? I mean, wh what is the goal of an object that can move like this? Right. If the goal of the object could be understood, that might tell you something about the function of the object. The function of the object tells you a little bit about what the materials 
might be required to accomplish what it's doing, right? And then, so you go down and down and down until you basically get to the atom. You go up and up and up and you get these emergent properties of the materials capabilities and the goals of the object. I mean, the object itself doesn't have a goal necessarily, except who it was behind it that built it. And, and so, you know, the, the, there's a whole panoply uh, and a whole range of questions that are opened, including going all the way out to religious, right? And, you know, you know who's, if, if these things are real, what does that imply about our religious understandings? Um, and, and God, I don't even want to pardon the phrase. I don't even want to, I don't want to even get into that necessarily because it opens a, a real Pandora's box of, um, self-questioning about ourselves. So that to me is, is interesting as well. There's a, a very cultural and psychosocial, I think at best, the realization that perhaps we aren't alone and something else has gotten here uh and is looking at us is for us to realize that maybe we should band together in a better way uh rather than fighting with each other and realize that you know not that we have to fight anybody out there i, I mean w whatever they are clearly could wipe us out by just pushing an asteroid in our direction if they wanted to uh is you know what what does that hopefully tell us about ourselves that if if anything we can survive because something else did. We don't have to blow ourselves up. Something else got beyond that stage. That's a good thing, I think. Yeah. And we also have a question from the audience asking about uh, when the CI visited your office. And they want to know if there's this group of people with believer or just if there's a legend that comes you know, like something uh, about the UFO or maybe extraterrestrial life. I don't know if you can answer this question. Uh, well, th they didn't come to me saying these were extraterrestrials or that these were UFOs. They came saying, we have these uh, individuals who were harmed. We know, and everybody tells us that you have made the best blood analysis systems currently used in the world. So what can you tell us about their blood? or what can your diagnostic instrumentation tell us about what happened to these people? Because again, it's, it's like, okay, if they supposedly got close to a, something that was emitting an energy that hurt them, studying how they were hurt might tell you what the energy was, right? And if you understand what the energy is, that gives you two possibilities. Maybe you can protect yourself against the energy. At the very least, it tells you don't get close to these things, right? And here might be the range of distance that you can safely approach. But then secondly, again, it, it's like you asked before, it offers the opportunity for reverse engineering or to understand what these things are. So, um, I mean, that was, as I mean, I, I had looked at all of the medical uh, files uh, that were made available to me. And I was convinced that the data was real. What I didn't know was, again, what conclusion could I make? And just so the audience understands, uh, I'm, not, I'm not foolish. I don't believe everything that everybody brings to me. Everything that is shown to me first, I first ask the question, am I being fooled? Is somebody trying to trick me because they want to discredit this area, right? Or they want to discredit me. I don't think anybody really cares about me, but, um, but I think that uh, I, it's very important for scientists who get involved in this to always look at it, it with a wary eye that just to make sure that, you know, the person bringing it to you, it isn't purposefully trying to fool you or hasn't been fooled themselves. They might think it's real, but, but they might be making a mistake. So, you know, it's, it's, this is the other reason, for instance, why I believe it's really important to go through the peer review process so that other people anonymously can look at what you're doing 
and can critique you to make sure that you're not fooling yourself, right? That you're, you know, and, and then, you know, you, you can publish something with as many caveats as, as you, you realize or you want. But if you look at any of my work in this area, we very, very carefully word things so that we don't come to conclusions. The newspapers who publish on the publications that we do think we made conclusions. I can't help that. But all I can, can do to continue to send the message uh, is just that we're still just publishing data and hopefully people believe that the data, the data is real. Mm -hmm. Since we close on time, I have three questions, maybe related to the peer review. And I think also Eva Lope was mentioning about the academic freedom. And I'm curious to ask you in this topic in particular, why there is the academics uh, maybe not really fully open-minded or dismissing that. And to be honest, there's, yeah, some people really hate to talk about that. I'm curious why, when you say at the beginning, why you don't want to talk about this? Why you dismiss this? Well, um, you know, I think it's been made fun of for so many years. You know, there have been television shows that are silly, right? Ancient Aliens, as an example. I mean, it started with a, a decent premise that, you know, were there aliens that visited in the past, but then it became silly, right? It became like a cartoon. And so it became easy to, you know, make fun of people with that. I mean, for instance, I was asked by um, NBC News and the Today Show to do a, uh, to do um, an interview with them a few weeks ago. And I finally decided, no, I wasn't interested in that. Um, and I remember writing an e starting to write an email that I said, look, I'll agree to do this as long as you don't play X-Files music, you know, throughout the thing. And then I said, ah, no, forget it. I'm just going to say no. So there they are. They run the, the spot on NBC News and the whole thing, they play X-Files music. And, and Avi Loeb was actually on that briefly and they played X-Files music right over him. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And so, you know, Avi, to his credit, just you know, spoke right through it. Um, so I think there's, there's, people are afraid of being shamed, uh, that they dare to think something. And I have been, you know, pat myself on the back. I've been successful in my career by knowing when I'm right and just doing it and not caring what other people tell me. If I know I'm right and I'm, I'm not doing unethical, just, and, and the question is reasonable, do it. And so uh, I, I kind of don't care what other people think because I know I'm right. <laughs> I know that sounds arrogant, but, but, you know, that's the only way you progress is by not letting other people shame you because shame is a kind of societal control that other people use to get you to do what they want you to do rather than what you want to do. It's a control function. And so maybe I'm just, you know, it was just built that way mentally that I, I, I think that if you don't ask the question, it will never be answered. And so asking a question shouldn't be wrong as long as you are not doing anything unethical, as long as you're not using resources you shouldn't be using, and as long as the goal is laudable. And if the goal is to understand our place in the universe, why shouldn't we do it? And if I'm, if it's, it's my time to do it, I, I want to use my time. And as long as I'm still, I have a lab of 30 people, as long as I'm still doing that, and I have four active companies, as long as I'm still helping them, why does it matter? If I spend an hour with you and your readers and listeners talking about something which is fun and important, I, you know, so it's I, I just don't I don't care if other people are critiquing, because I mean now uh, the people who are uh, who think we shouldn't be talking about it have been now proven wrong because the government has come out and said this stuff is real. I mean, this is a this is a historic event to have the U.S. government come out and openly say these things are real. We don't know what they are, but they're real. I mean, to me, 
I've had now a number of my science colleagues, my mainstream colleagues, including some that said, Gary, you shouldn't be doing this, write me emails and say, Gary, it looks like you might have been right. This is interesting. So minds are changing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Yeah. And what do you think maybe final thought about other possibilities besides maybe understanding physics or maybe how we can design this, such material like this? What other possibility do you think would help even for you and Avi to to go? Maybe, as Avi said, he maybe could be wrong, for example. And for you, maybe it's something come from the engine, something we, we don't need in physics we can understand. What are other possibilities do you think just for people? Because some people said, why we should bother about that? Why should we bother? Well, I mean, from a place in the universe perspective, it'd be nice to know that we're we're not alone, but um, you know, from a uh, just from a science advancement standpoint, again, to to know that there is a level of physics beyond us that we can aspire to, I think that's important to know. To basically, if I get a hold of some of these materials that people have told me, I will be able to help them study now that they haven't been able to do anything before using this atomic imaging scope that I want to build. Uh, Maybe we'll understand something about how you can put materials together to do things we don't know how to do today. That to me is a positive. You know, maybe there's an energy generation system here that could help, uh, you know, create energy more easily, right? Some of the people who study these things think that they're accessing the so-called zero point field energy. That the only way that they could move from point A to point B with that level of speed is that they are basically reaching into the zero point field and they're pulling out the energy from the zero point field. That would be amazing. You know, the other possibility is though, if you make something like that and there's so much energy there, that could be a weapon. That's a bad thing. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, science always has that kind of give and take of possibilities. So uh, to me, I'm an optimist. I think at the end of the day, humans will do the right thing. Uh, you know, we sometimes make mistakes, but uh, to me, the opportunity to understand something more about the universe and to use technology in a more, you know, useful manner to help humanity, that to me is what excites me. That's what gets me up every morning. Mm-hmm. And that sent what makes you maybe fulfilled and satisfied. Yeah, that, you know, if it the, uh, I, I don't expect, you know, I'm 61 years old. So uh, I don't expect in the next 20 years that we'll understand this, you know, completely. I'll still be happy that I was able to play a part in in making it possible for people to study this area credibly uh, and to con- and for others to contribute, I think others will make the big discoveries, and that to me, it's always about you know. I even look at my students. I I look and hope and see potential in my students, and that is what I want to bring forward in my students, and that's what I want to bring forward here. I see potential here for humanity at large, and that to me is really what I think. I'm working towards. And finally, I don't know if you have any advice was given to you and it was a life-changing advice. Or maybe through this decade, since you mentioned, you do that you believe in and you seem to don't care about shaming or critiquing. But what advice was given to you and was a life-changing advice, if you remember? So, I mean, I think the, the, the best advice is, is um, don't try to convince anybody of a conclusion, right? Know when you think something is real and just get down and spend the time and and do it and analyze it yourself to your own self-satisfaction and then uh, publish it if you can or work with others who can help you publish it and go the conventional route. Don't try to convince your family members. Don't try to convince your friends. It, it, it's not about convincing them by discussion. It's about going the more traditional route uh, the tried and true, uh, and 
don't come to conclusions. Because all it takes is one disproof of your conclusion, and you're wrong. I think we need, as a, let's say, your society, to form study groups, right, at a professional level, to say how can they contribute and what might be the advantage that comes to, you know, the IAE, right, to understand this. I mean, already, I think the, um, the aeronautics uh, and um, aerospace community, which is like 50,000 people, they had a four-hour uh, uh, symposia on this subject. It was supposed to be one hour. It went for four hours. And they've formed a study group to basically say, and, and their interest in it was primarily because um, they say, okay, well, this might be actually be a threat to aeronautics. You know, if one of these things shows up and it, you know, it causes us to divert and might cause a crash or something like that. So that was, you know, th that was the kind of real world consequence of it. But of course, behind that is, well, what are these things and how do they do it? So once you start getting professional organizations beginning to talk about this openly, and I am working with some other people to start to get a bi some of the biology uh, um, professional organizations to form around this, you know, there's always safety in numbers. And so, you know, trying to do something individually is great. But once we can form organizations that will move this forward, um, again, the safety in numbers can give even me arguments that I don't know about, right? It's always about how you word things and how you position things. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's white papers that need to be written on this subject. How do we talk to religions, right? This is not my specialty, but there are people who are already being brought in uh, around this to talk about it. How do you talk to the various religions about this? Yeah. I don't know if you have any final words like to say, any final words like to say for the audience here? Uh, the only thing I say is, is I'd like to thank the audience for keeping an open mind about this. Um, and, uh, if anybody has any, uh, you know, any materials that they're aware of, um, let me know. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer questions uh, from uh, individuals or help them whatever I can. I, I answer every email. It might take me a couple of weeks, but no email, no matter how crazy sounding it might be, uh, 